So you might remember from last time a picture that looked uh, a lot like the picture that I've got up here where uh, we were relating a parameter uh, called angle of twist that was right here on the front of this member. We were relating that to the shearing strain that was occurring on the outer surface of this part, right? And I wanted to put this up here so that we could look at it as we try to answer the question right up there at the top, and that is, can we find a way to calculate this angle of twist using information that for an average, you know, physical element that's out there, that we could calculate that angle of twist using information readily available for, for a member like that, okay? So, for example, it's not hard to find the length of a member that you're planning on trying to figure out how much it will twist under a particular load, right? So that would be one that, that it wouldn't be hard to find that. What else might not be hard to find for a member like this? Okay. Something that has to do with the diameter, right? And one of the things that's related to the diameter is actually the polar moment of inertia. And the reason I say it's more than just the diameter is that this would also apply if the member was a hollow circular shape as well as this solid circular shape that I've got. Okay. So those are a couple that are easy to think of right at the beginning of, of parameters that would be easier for us to find. Let's get into this and see if we can come up with a, uh, a formula for the angle of twist. And let me start with a formula that we uh, used while we were in the middle of deriving uh, the torsional stress formula that we did last time. Okay, And it was this. If we took the uh, shearing strain on the outer surface of the part and multiplied by the length of the member, we said that was approximately equal to the uh, angle of twist times the radius to the outer surface of the part. You guys probably remember that that was one of the places that we started, right? Well, what I'd like to do with this is actually solve it for theta, right? That's what we're trying to find. So let me go ahead and solve it for theta. And uh, when I do that, it ends up being this, uh, and i tell you what else I'll do. You might remember that we didn't keep the notation of gamma sub c, right? We changed that out for another notation that we called gamma max. And we did that because the maximum shearing strain that occurs in a member like this occurs on the outer surface of the part that's being twisted, right? So we change it out for gamma max. Um, and then this would be multiplied by L over C then if we're trying to solve this out for theta, okay? You also might remember that we did come up with that formula for uh, shearing stress. And actually we had a formula for maximum shearing stress. What was that formula? Anyone remember? Okay. <coughs> I'll give you a hint. It looked a little bit like the flexural stress formula that we used. Flexural stress, okay, yeah, the, the flexural stress formula was MC over I. The torsional stress formula is TC over J. Okay? Well, you might also remember that we restricted our whole analysis that we did last time to only being in the elastic region of this material. And what I'd like to do here is, uh, you know, basically divide both sides of that little uh, stress equation right there by the modulus of rigidity, like this, okay? Why do you think I'm doing that? Okay, not, not so I can go beyond the area of elasticity, but yeah, you might remember that shearing stress is equal to the modulus of rigidity times shearing strain, right? Which means if I take shearing stress and divide by the modulus of rigidity, what does it give me? Shearing strain, right? So if I divide both sides of this by G, then what this actually gives me uh, on, the, on the left side there is the maximum shearing strain, which again occurs on the outer surface of the part that's being twisted. Well, you might notice there that's something I can substitute in now over here into this formula. 
I can now say that theta is going to be equal to uh, TC over GJ times L over C. And what can I do with that? What can I do with C? That divides out, right? And if I rewrite this in a little bit cleaner form, we can say that the angle of twist is going to be equal to T times L over G times J. Okay. And one of the reasons I knew, I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining this as I went along, one of the reasons I knew that this was the direction I was going is that just writing my angle of twist equation up here in terms of shearing strain, that's not quite good enough yet because shearing strain is not an easy parameter for us to look at a member that's twisting and necessarily know exactly how much shearing strain is happening in the member, especially because the shearing strains tend to be very small as angles, right? So it's hard for us to be able to look at a member and know how much shearing strain is in it. But what we get to do there is replace information uh, like that, the shearing strain, with information that comes from how much torque is being applied as opposed to being able to directly measure the shearing strain, right? So we can do things like predict how much a twisting member will twist under a particular load given that we know what? The torque being applied, the length of the member that's being twisted, okay? The modulus of rigidity of the member, which is kind of a thing that tells us how stiff the material is, and the uh, polar second moment of area, J. Okay? And that's one of our main equations that we needed to get to today is how do we come up with these angles of twist? We use this formula TL over GJ. Okay? Now, I want you to think about something else. Remember doing axial loading. Okay, when we did axial loading, our formula for deformation, this was elongation of a member that was being loaded uh, along its, its axis, what was that formula like? Remember it was, it deflects not very much, only a flea, all right, you all remember that one? What I'm pointing out here is that there's not actually that much for you to memorize uh, when you're memorizing these equations because they actually end up being very similar in form. So think about this. Torque is kind of the analogy of force with respect to these kinds of problems, right? Like it's kind of the applied influence that's making it do something, right? Length is a direct analogy. It's just how long is the piece. What about G? Okay, G is the modulus of rigidity, right, which relates shearing stress to shearing strain. What is E? Modulus of elasticity, which relates normal stress to normal strain, right? And then what about J and A? Okay, they're both related to what kind of size, and uh, especially in the case of J, it's also related to sort of the shape but it's related to the, the amount of area that's there to resist the, uh, the load that's being applied. J is a little bit more tricky than A, where A is just a cross-sectional area, and J is this polar second moment of area, but they, you can still kind of see the analogy between the two. Right. So I just kind of want you to see that. Um, this is for torsional loading. And that's, that other one's for axial loading. Okay. I also mentioned it just a few minutes ago that we have a formula here. Uh, the stress is equal to TC over J. That's very similar to the uh, normal stress due to flexure is equal to what? MC over I, right? And you can see here that these formulas wind up being so similar to each other, it almost feels like less to memorize. Okay. So... I just didn't want that to go by without mentioning that there are a lot of similarities between these formulas that exist for the various types of loading. Okay? All right.
Well, the next question is, this was a great way to find the angle of twist for one little segment of a member. What if we go to a member that has more than one segment? Okay, and what I mean by that is we can define a segment of a shaft anywhere where the cross-sectional shape changes or where the amount of load that it carries changes, the torque that I mentioned up there, or where the material properties change, right? That being the, the particular material property I care to think about there is the modulus of rigidity, right? So anywhere that those things change, uh, we could end up having uh, a different formula that we apply. But you might notice here that it basically can be an, a sum of all of the twists of the various segments of the beam, you know, each one of which is not hard to evaluate with the formula that we just found. So let me kind of sketch that out here, okay? Think of uh, segment AB here. When it starts to twist, right, It'll twist so that it's a line that was drawn along its side is going to twist up to some location like this, right? And if I was going to draw a, uh, a line back to the center here, it would, it would go in something like this. Well, if segment BC didn't twist any more than, you know, segment AB, in other words, let's say that TB is causing segment AB to twist, but TC is zero, let's say. Right? Then all you would, the, the total twist of the entire length of this shaft would just be the twist of AB. But that doesn't encompass all the possibilities because we could also have a non-zero torque applied at joint C. So what I want to show you there is just the twist of AB has now caused a shift in the position of that line that I originally had drawn on this uh, segment BC. Right, so that's going to be its new position just because of the change in position um, or change in angular position due to the twisting of AB. Right, now we can have yet another amount of twist that happens due to the twisting of BC. Right, so let me kind of sketch this out here. So this, you know, this angle right here would have been maybe something that I could reasonably call like a theta AB, right? And that would be the same theta AB that I would identify right here. And then on top of that, there would be another angle, right? That would be how far it additionally twisted because of the twist that happens in segment BC. So I could maybe call that up here theta BC. Okay, I'm not sure if that's making sense or if that's hard to follow that um, diagram that I'm drawing there. But what we can basically conclude here is that the theta that happens in this shaft between A and C is going to be equal to the theta that happens from A to B plus the theta that happens from B to C, right? So that's specifically for this little shaft that I've sh I'm showing right here. In order to make the notation work out a little bit better, what I'd like to do is change up my labeling here a little bit. And instead of using A, B, and B, C, let me call this segment one. And this over here, let me call this segment two. Right? And then the overall twist of the whole thing, let me just call that theta without a subscript. Right? Okay? And if that's how my notation I'm using, then the same uh, relationship here applies, and we say that theta is equal to theta 1 plus theta 2. And the reason I'm changing this notation here a little bit is to kind of get us this idea that we can have as many segments as we want that we stack up along here, right? And those little numbers for theta one, theta two, right? Those little indexes, uh, we can just add as many of those as we want to, to to deal with however many segments that we want, right? Okay, and so what that would tell us here is that the total amount of twists that would happen is going to be equal to the sum 
for I equal 1 to N, right, of the amount of twist that happens for each member. Okay? And how much is that? Like how much twist happens in theta AB, or in, uh, in segment AB? We have to take the torque that's carried in member AB in segment AB, right? So maybe I'll call that TAB times what? LAB, right? The, whatever that length is, divided by whatever the modulus of rigidity is, right, of AB, okay? times the J value that we have for AB, right? And to that, I'm going to have to add uh, the torque carried in member BC times the length of BC over the modulus of rigidity of BC times the polar second moment of area of BC. Okay? Now, if I switch over to my kind of numer numerical notation, this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this shifting, is that it's not necessarily straightforward always to know how much torque is carried in each one of these segments, okay? Like for this example right here, if I t take the direction that those torques are being applied and I think about doing a torque diagram for this body, what would that look like? Okay. Generally speaking, what happens here is we start at a free end and there's going to be a rise of whatever that value is of TC, right? And then it's going to keep that value to where this other one is being applied, right? And then at that point, we're going to add another TB onto that and then that's what's going to react at the support, right? So at the end of it, we would basically say that there's a TC torque carried in segment two, and in segment one, there is going to be uh, a TC plus TB because of how we saw how torque accumulates based on the problem we did last time, right? The torque accumulates as we go down the length of this shaft, okay? So rather than me uh, try to define it in terms of everywhere that a torque could be applied, we basically generalize this equation and we say, you go in and you find how much torque is on each little segment. And we're going to call each one of those little torques T sub I. For this one, T sub AB would be like T sub 1, and T sub 1 would be TC plus TB, right? TBC, this torque in the other segment, would be like torque 2, and it would be like just T sub C. So anyway, T I L I over G I J I. Okay, so it's not really different and it might feel like I belabored that a little bit, maybe I did, but this is how we deal with shafts that have multiple segments, right? And a segment is defined anywhere where you have a change in the cross-section, a change in the material properties, specifically the modulus of rigidity, or a change in the amount of torque that's being carried. Okay? So as a thought experiment before I leave this, you know, this little derivation kind of thing that we did right here, what would happen if I added another torque, let's say right here? Right? Like let's say at some location right here. What happens now? Let's, let's just call that, you know, T, uh, just T. I'll just put another T on there. Okay? Instead of there being two segments, now I have to do three segments because I have to basically split AB into two segments. I would do a segment from the, where that extra torque is being applied toward B and then another segment from where that extra torque is being applied back toward A. You know, that would actually change my uh, torque diagram here, right? I would basically have to add yet another segment of whatever that extra torque was being applied, right? 
and that would be my three segments that I would then deal with. Does that make sense? So anywhere where any one of those parameters changes, we're going to have to you know, define another segment at each one of those locations. All right? Yes, sir. Okay, so he's saying anything could vary, could be the, the diameter or radius, uh, or could be material properties. I would say that this form of this equation only deals with the possibility that there are discrete changes. In other words, there's going to be a, a concentrated torque that's being applied at a particular location that causes a step change in the amount of torque that's happening in the member. Or there would be a, an instantaneous change in the amount of uh, cross-section, that, like the diameter got suddenly larger, like this one where it's got kind of a shoulder and it you know, goes from one diameter instantly to another diameter. Okay? Now, um, it's not that hard to do a problem similar to this where you can deal with continuous changes. Like you could have a cone, someone says. And really, the only thing that changes there is instead of doing a discrete sum like we have here, the formula would look more like this. You would want to take an integral over the entire length of the shaft, and you'd have to define your limits to make that work, right, of the torque as a function of x over your modulus of rigidity as a function of x and your j as a function of x. And however many of those were variable, if you could find those functions, you'd put all those in here. And then what takes the place of the li would be a dx, right? Because x would be assumed to be the variable along which the, uh, the shaft was extended, right? So this is not something that, you know, we are going to hold you accountable to learning in here. But since you mentioned it, I figured I'd mention that there is an integral form of this same equation, and that can deal with continual changes as opposed to discrete changes. Yes? Okay, he's saying, why would the modulus of rigidity possibly not be a constant? Okay, and so let me give you one scenario that might cause that, okay? Um, there are a lot of different processes for making materials out there. Uh, one of them, actually there's a whole family of processes of making materials that involves taking powders and compressing them into some sort of a shape. Sometimes it's done at a slightly elevated temperature, but maybe not enough of a temperature elevation to make it actually melt, right? So let's say you're making a part with a process like that, and maybe due to how your tooling is set up, you achieve more pressure on one end of the part relative to the other end of the part, and so you end up making it denser, right? In that case, then I would presume that you would probably have a variable amount of modulus of rigidity in, in effect because the, the material is actually changing properties. It could be changing properties continuously, right? It's, it's not one I've actually run across. It's just it's one I could think of that maybe there might be a, a uh, manufacturing process that might end up giving you uh, variable material properties as you go down the length, okay? The one that's probably more likely, or the two that are probably more likely are uh, either a distributed torque somehow applied along the surface of a part so that it, you know, accumulates gradually, um, or the one that really applies in a lot of cases is J because all you have to have is like a cone-shaped piece and now J is going to be varying continuously. So anyway, good questions, but again, that's not really something I'm going to hold you accountable to. I am going to hold you accountable to knowing how to do the discrete shafts, okay? And while we're talking about that, let's get started with an example problem. Okay? So for this example problem, we have two motors that are set up to drive two machines. Okay, there's a motor at each end. Motor A is producing 270 foot-pounds of torque, and motor D is producing 60 foot-pounds of torque. We know somehow that it takes 90 foot-pounds of torque to drive machine B, and 240 foot-pounds of torque to drive machine C. Okay? 
Um, what we want to do is estimate the angle of twist for each shaft segment and also the overall angle of twist for the entire length of shaft, all the way from motor A to motor D. Okay? So where shall we start? Well, I have an idea. What if we start by redrawing it and make it a little bit easier for us to see all the different pieces? Okay? So let's say we draw the, uh, the left segment here. And here we've got a middle segment. And then we've got the right segment. And we're going to kind of ignore the, what happens inside of machine B and machine C. Let's say that they're short enough lengths that we say that the amount of twist that happens inside of where the torque is taken off into those machines is negligible. Okay? So there's our, our little shaft there. What torques are being applied? I don't care. Uh, let's start at A. What direction should I apply it? All right. Answer is it doesn't really matter. Okay. But we need to be consistent about which things are applying torques. And we're going to need to think a little bit about how energy is being delivered from the motors to the machines in order to think about how those torques are being delivered. So here's what I propose. Why don't we go ahead and assume a direction that the shaft is rotating, right? Because the, the presumption here is that the shaft is running at a constant speed. It says that over there on the left, actually. So it's running at a constant speed. Let's pick a direction that we think the shaft is running. What direction do you want to choose? <clears throat> What's that? Okay, clockwise, so I think what you might be saying is maybe this way. Okay, well, if that's the direction that the shaft is turning, it means that the direction that motor D is applying torque to the shaft is probably in this direction because a motor's job is to deliver energy into the system, right? It's supposed to put energy into the end of that shaft, right? And in order for it to do that, it has to apply torque the same direction as motion is happening. Right? That's what actually delivers the energy into the shaft is the fact that the direction of torque is the same as the direction of rotation. Okay? So let's go ahead and put that on there as 60 foot-pounds. Okay? Since that's the direction it's rotating there, it's probably also the direction that's rotating it at A, right? Which means that A is probably also applying torque that same direction of 270 foot-pounds. Okay? Now we've got machine B and machine C. What do you think their role is in terms of delivering or absorbing energy out of the shaft? Yeah, so they're probably absorbing energy which means that they are going to be applying a torque to the shaft the opposite direction of the direction of rotation, right? So if the direction of rotation is the direction we showed there, it means that these are going to have sort of these reaction torques that happen the opposite direction there, all right? And it says for machine B, uh, it takes 90 foot-pounds. And for machine C, it takes... 240 foot-pounds. Okay. One of the reasons I set this up is so that we could do a torque diagram for this. Okay. And doing this torque diagram, we will notice um, that this shaft actually is in equilibrium based on the numbers that are given to us for the torques at A, B, C, and D. 
right? So what we'll see there, if I define a location of zero, say right here, right? Let's say this thing drops by 60 foot-pounds where motor D is. It'll keep that torque to where machine C is, is uh, located. Machine C applies a torque the opposite direction. Okay, of 240 which makes it go up how high? Okay, it'll go up to 180. Okay, which I might not be able to draw this perfectly to scale, but I'll just, I'll draw it this way anyway. Let's say it goes up by 180, or goes up by 240, excuse me. Which leaves us at a value of 180. And then it's going to go up again by another 90 so that it ends up being at 270. And then that's how much is being applied at the other end. All right. And this is torque. And these are all going to be in foot pounds. Okay, one of the reasons it's nice to do this is that it gives us a visual on how exactly the torques exist everywhere in the shaft. Okay, and here's why that matters. We can now find the theta, the amount of angle of twist that happens for each one of these segments. Okay, let me start with segment AB. Okay, or if I want to, I can kind of use the same method I did before, I could call this segment one, I could call this segment two, and I could call this segment three. So let me call this segment one right here, right? And I could take the amount of torque over there, let's say 270 foot-pounds, times the length of that segment, which is 14 inches, divide it by the modulus of rigidity in that section, Okay, so the modulus of rigidity in that section can be found in the reference material. Okay, um, I believe it said here that it was made of 4340 heat treated steel, right? So in the reference material, that 4340 heat treated steel has a modulus of rigidity of 11,000 KSI, which is the same thing as 11 times 10 to the sixth PSI. Okay, and then J can be calculated with pi over 32. Times what? times that diameter, the diameter there is 0.825 inches to the fourth, right? That's based on what we derived and memorized last time was the, these formulas for uh, polar second moment of area, okay? Now, I might need to multiply by one other thing, too. What's that? Yeah, I've got feet up here in the numerator and everything else is in inches. So we're probably going to want to take that and make it um, a, a number that's in inches. So to do that, I need to take a 12 inch per foot factor up here in the top. Okay, so punching all this in, I get uh, 270 times 14 times 12 divided by 11 times 10 to the sixth times pi times 0.825 raised to the fourth divided by 32. Okay, 
And this gives me a number, 0 0.0906 or 907. Okay, what is that? What is that measured in? Okay, yeah, if you look at all the units up here, uh, we can actually see how they all cancel out. Feet cancel feet. Okay, these inches cancel these inches. The pounds here cancels PSI, right? And actually, this didn't, sorry, the inch there didn't cancel the inch there, but the, those two inches, along with the square inches in PSI, cancel the inches to the fourth in the denominator, right? Because you have inches times inches in the numerator, right? That cancels two of the inches to the fourth in the denominator, and the other two get canceled by the per square inch in the PSI, okay? So it ends up having no units in that whole calculation. And one of the ways you can interpret that is that usually means that you're talking about an amount of twist in radians, which that actually also jibes with our uh, original derivation of this at the beginning, we said that theta had to be in radians. So anyway, this is a value in radians. What if we want it in degrees? Okay. Yeah, we can convert this by doing 180 degrees per pi radians. Okay. So if I multiply this by 180, divided by pi, this gives me a number of degrees, 5.195. Okay, what next? You can go to the next segment, segment two. I guess I'll do that down here. Theta 2 is going to be equal to, um, we have 180 foot-pounds there. Okay. Multiplied by the length of that segment, which is going to be 16 inches. Okay. We're probably still going to need our factor of 12 inches per foot. In the denominator, we're going to need the modulus of rigidity, this time, of titanium. So we can go back into the reference material and find where we have titanium alloy. And we're finding the modulus of rigidity there, 5.3 thousand KSI, right? Which that, again, is going to be equal to 5.3 times 10 to the sixth PSI. Okay, and then lastly, we have to find J. And finding J in this center segment is a little bit trickier because we have both an outer and an inner diameter because it's a hollow shaft, right? So we'll have to take 0.9 inches to the fourth minus 0.75 inches to the fourth. Okay, and we can calculate that. So um, go ahead and put a fraction in here, 180 times 16 times 12 divided by 5.3 times 10 to the sixth times pi times, here I put 0.9 to the fourth, oop, yeah, minus uh, 0.75 to the fourth, okay? And then all of this I'm going to divide by 32. And that gives me 0.1955 radians.
And what's that in degrees? Okay, again, I'll multiply by 180 and divide by pi, 100, 180 degrees per radian. This gives me 11.203 degrees. Okay, we got one more. The last one is made of 6061 T6 aluminum, solid 0.75 inch in diameter. Okay. So it's going to have uh, 60. Now here's a little bit tricky here. Does that segment twist the same direction as my previous segments? Why not? Okay. Because my torque, if you look at my torque diagram, it goes the opposite direction of my other torques. So when I do this one, I'm going to count it with a negative torque. <coughs> because that torque goes the opposite direction for this one. All right, I'm going to multiply this by 9 inches. Okay, again, I'll multiply it by 12 inches per foot. Okay. Um, in the denominator, I need to look up what the modulus of rigidity is for this 6061 T6 um, aluminum. Okay. I'm going to use here 3.8 thousand KSI. Okay. I'll take a second right here and say I've seen a lot of people screw these problems up over the years just from taking the, the number out of the E column instead of the G column. Just be very, very careful while you're working these problems. Find that G instead of E, right? So I know that doesn't help that much for me to say that because if you knew, like, no one would intentionally do that. But maybe you'll go back and remember that I said something about that and maybe catch yourself before making an error, maybe. Anyway, 3.8 thousand KSI. which again, I can express that with 3.8 times 10 to the uh, sixth PSI. Okay, this is gonna be again multiplied by the diameter to the fourth times pi over 32. Okay, so I'll do it again like this, pi over 32 times the diameter, 0.75 inches to the fourth. All right, minus, let's see, we'll take this as minus 60 times 9 times 12 over 3.8 times 10 to the 6th times pi times 0.75 raised to the 4th over 32. All right, negative 0 0.0549 radians. And if I convert that into degrees, like I did the other ones, multiply by 180 over pi, it gives me 3.145. degrees, negative. All right, so that gives me my angle of twist of each section, each segment. And so my overall angle of twist is again this sum, I equal one for our case to three of TI LI over GI JI right? For us, this is just going to be equal to each of these values that we just found, 
5.195 degrees plus 11.203 degrees uh, minus 3.145 degrees. This winds up giving me 13.253 degrees. And that's the overall angle of twist that happens from one motor to the other. Okay? So I would say these, are, these problems typically don't end up very difficult, you know, uh, kind of like the torsional stress problems. Um, but they're nice to know how to do them and to know that, you know, we can figure out how much something twists under a torsional load. Any questions? Yeah. It can be, right? So the, it's a good question. He says he has trouble visualizing the, this shaft. He says, is it turning in this example? And the answer to that is, as long as it's turning at a constant speed, we don't care. What we're talking about with respect to these angles is a relative twist at one end of the shaft relative to the other one. And that can be twisted like that and the whole thing spinning. Right, so... Our only thing we're doing is we're saying dynamic effects aren't a problem because everything's running at constant speed. So we're not thinking about, you know, the idea of anything accelerating. And so, you know, but it could still be spinning at a constant speed and one end of the shaft can still be displaced angularly relative to the other end of the shaft. And it, as it's spinning, it just stays in that angular displacement relative to the other end of the shaft. So that was one question. You said you had two. Right. His other question is, what would you use something like this for? Okay. Um, that's also a good question. Um, this one, it might be hard for me to kind of cast a scenario on this as to why it would matter, but let me try. Okay. What if those motors had to be in phase with each other within a certain tolerance? In other words, what if those two motors, something about maybe how they're driven, they need to be uh, in sync with each other, right? When I say in phase, I mean to where the armature of one motor has to stay aligned with the armature of the other motor within some range or else the motors quit working as well, all right? That's a somewhat realistic possibility because a lot of these motors are driven off of an AC voltage that's going to be the same for motor D as for motor A. It's going to be in the same, you know, frequency at the same time and all that kind of stuff. Well, if the internal mechanics of the motor makes it to where the armature has to stay in the same position for one motor relative to the other one, but the shafts themselves are beginning to twist, then it, it could make one of your motors less efficient than the other one, right? What's that? So he's saying, what if one of the motors stopped producing the amount of torque that it uh, originally could? And that would be an interesting question. You know, the question there might end up becoming, does the other motor have enough torque to overcome it, right, or, or not? I would say the actual torque that shafts like this might experience is usually a pretty dynamic thing. Like, we might have a pretty good idea that it's around this value for this motor and about this much value for this other one. But if this was a real setup like this, there's a pretty good chance that over time, things might shift between one and the other, and maybe these values wouldn't all stay exactly these numbers. But anyway, to answer the, the bigger question about, you know, what will we use this for, right? There's a lot of examples of where, you know, maybe something can twist a certain amount and it's fine, like it won't cause a problem within a certain range, 
but if it starts twisting too much, you might be concerned about it, right? And it might be before the material actually fails. We didn't do this part of this problem, but I did actually pick all the values here so that our factors of safety in all of these segments are about four, right? So none of those segments of shaft are failing according to the data that we've got in our reference material, okay? And so they're able to twist that, a much, that much without failing, but there's a possibility that twisting that much could cause something else to not go well. And that could be another factor you might have to consider when you're designing something, okay? Um, let me give you another example, actually, of where something like this is useful. Uh, a lot of you actually might drive vehicles that instead of having traditional springs, like coil springs or leaf springs, a lot of you might actually drive vehicles that get the springiness of their suspension out of a, a member like this that twists, right? And they, they call that a torsion bar suspension right, where you've got a torsion bar that's actually supplying this kind of twist. Uh, a long time ago, I had a uh, 1990 uh, Mazda pickup truck, and the front suspension on that vehicle had torsion bar suspension. There were these torsion bars that ran down the length of the vehicle, and they uh, attached up into my uh, front control arms of the vehicle, and it caused them to want to flex down, and then as I hit things, it would cause those shafts that were going this way to, f to twist, and that's where I got the springiness of my front suspension in that vehicle. Um, actually, uh, one of the very first vehicles that made this work was Volkswagen. If you, go, if you look at Volkswagen Beetles, the, the very old ones that were highly, highly, highly popular, uh, they were one of the first like, widely uh, produced vehicles that successfully used uh, torsion bar suspension. They use it in the rear. So they actually put the torsion bars that go like crossways in the car and then there's a trailing arm that goes out of the um, out of that torsion bar and that's where it gets the springiness in the rear suspension of a Volkswagen. So anyway, so you wouldn't in that application you would need to know what the relationship was between torque and twist so that you would know what kind of an effective spring constant you were getting out of a suspension system like that. Those are a couple of examples where it might matter to you that, that you know how to figure out how much twist per torque. All right, any other questions?